everyone for attending today's Vertical Farming Innovation in Japan and the US. BIC is very excited to host this event in collaboration with Natalie Jackson and our great uh, two speakers. I'd just like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Jesse. I manage the Japan Desk at the Cambridge Innovation Center, or CIC. CIC provides flexible office space to innovators and entrepreneurs around the world. We got started in Cambridge, Massachusetts 20 years ago, and we now have locations around the globe, including our latest international center, CIC Tokyo. At CIC, I manage the Japan Desk with the mission of connecting the entrepreneurial communities of Boston and Japan. If you have any questions about today's event or what the Japan Desk does in general, you can reach me by email. I will share my email address in the chat. Um, now I'd like to introduce my co-organizer and moderator for today's event, Natalie Jackson. Natalie graduated with distinction in Harvard Business School's class of 2021. She served as co-president of the HBS Food, Agriculture, and Water Club and is passionate about commercializing technologies that can transform our food system in both Japan and the US. So now I would like to pass it off to Natalie. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you to CIC Japan Desk for hosting this event. As Jesse mentioned, my name is Natalie Jackson, and I'm passionate about commercializing technologies to solve our biggest human and environmental health problems. So a little bit about me. I'm prior, prior to Harvard Business School, I worked as a healthcare investment banker at Citigroup and an investor at Stanford University's multi-billion dollar endowment. During this time, I supported companies solving big problems across industries and geographies, but I then decided to pursue my MBA at HBS to focus on solving problems in our food system, such as limited access to nourishing food and the significant environmental footprint of our food system, as both of these challenges have massive implications on human and environmental health. While at HBS, as Jesse mentioned, I was co-president of the HBS Food, Agriculture, and Water Club, and also co-founded Nucleate Eco, an incubator for Harvard and MIT students launching life sciences ventures solving climate change. I'm currently a board member of the Harvard Alumni for Agriculture and Food Association, and my intention is to move to Japan to continue solving human and environmental health problems. That intention led me to Jessie at CIC Japan Desk as she works at the intersection of innovation in both the Japanese and Boston communities. So as we were brainstorming ideas to host a food tech event this summer, it was very clear that controlled environment agriculture, which we broadly define as greenhouses, vertical farming, controlled indoor farms, plant factories, urban rooftops, that entire area is a huge area of innovation relevant to both the Japanese and US food systems for a few reasons. Number one, in Japan, vertical farming and plant factories in particular have a rich history of research, technological evolution, and commercial advancement. And then in the US, there is similarly a rich history of research and recently controlled environment agriculture companies using both greenhouses and vertical farming have attracted billions of dollars in investment capital. Still, in my mind, and I'm sure on many of your minds, there are a lot of questions that remain about the technology, about products, about commercial viability, about geographic expansion. Namely, for me, how is controlled environment agriculture supporting the transformation of our global food system to be more sustainable, resilient, and nourishing? So that's why I'm super delighted and grateful to introduce our two speakers who can address some of these questions. I'd like to first introduce Ari Hayashi, who is Vice President and Director of International Relations and Consulting at Japan Plant Factory Association, and Lauren Abda, who is co-founder and partner at Branch Venture Group and founder of Branch, Branch Food. So the agenda will go as follows. We'll start with Ari, who will give a short presentation about what's going on in Japan. We'll then turn it over to Lauren, who will share what's going on in the US. Thereafter, I will pose a couple of questions to our speakers so that we can better understand both regions. And we're going to incorporate many of the questions that you all submitted when you registered for the event. While I'm moderating, also please use the chat function and submit additional questions and we'll try to address those as well. So Ari, I will turn it over to you. Hi, thank you for your kind introduction. Um, let me share my screen first. Can you see it okay? 
All good. Okay, thanks. Hi, everyone. Good, good morning. Good evening. Um, I'm Eri Hayashi uh, from Japan Plant Factory Association. I'm a vice president also in charge of international department of uh, the organization. Um, I'm really glad to uh, meet you all and uh, thank you very much for the Jesse and Natalie and all the um, organizer for organizing this event. I'm happy to um, for the discussion. Thank you very much. So today um, it's limited time. I like to I like I do my best to introduce who we are, Japan Plant Factory Association, JPFA is, and also a little bit about the principle and concept of plant factory and the current situation challenge and also where we are going. Uh, for the next generation. So J Japan Plant Factory Association, or JMPFA, was founded in 2010 with a mission to develop and also introduce sustainable plant um, production system with a collab collaboration of academia in the industry. It's a nonprofit organization. So member-based organization, well, around 200 uh, individual and uh, organizational members. So there are mainly four activities that we do research and development, also on um, also um, um, training, workshops, and also public relations standardization, and also business and technical um, business support in Japan and also abroad. So here we are, um, I'm in Japan. We are based in the, one of the campus of Chiba University, uh, Kashiwanoha campus. Um, Kashiwanoha is uh, it's known as an agriculture driven smart city. Um, we are here. So it's, um, so we, um, it's like a showcase of housing that um, we have multiple uh, greenhouses and then a plant factory system on site that we manage. So, um, so the, we do the applied demonstration research with a collaboration with different consortium with a company and the government and then the universities. So as you can see here, um, I mean, plant factory or vertical farming have so much potential in the different application and also the size. So as you can see, a like large scale or small scale or even for the restaurants or hotel or even for the home use. So plant factory, um, is can have a potential contributing the, co concurrently for the mainly on the our global four challenges including food security resource saving and environment conservation also the quality of life the, the plant, so we use the term plant factory with artificial lighting people that's the biggest feature is that the cultivation room a structure is closed with, it's highly airtight and semi insulated. So with that, you can visualize how much input and how much output and, and for the online, on, um, continuously online. So it's easy to visualize what's going on. So, so meaning that when, while you are producing, meaning that you are generating uh, tons of data. So that's why it's one of the reasons that it's attracting for IT companies, because it's really um, it's really easy to um, use this data than the, uh, the data from outside. So it's a mainly a six component, uh, like using the uh, LEDs or uh, multiple um, yeah, cultivations or uh, coolings or neutral solution environment control unit. So the so the plant factory meaning that you can design the environment. So we get the freedom, but at the same time, it's really hard to find the ultimate set point because you got so much freedom. So the, um, potentially the plant factory have um, um, be, um, the biggest feature is that the high productivities and uniformity and also reproducibilities. So this is the biggest feature, but also it's still, it, there must so much space to be improved, especially like a uniformity or reproducibility. So that we, there are so much space that we can improve. So for example, for the reproducibility is that you maybe you have a um, result that from the experiment that you have done in the lab, the little lab in the, um, the, at the research institute, for example, but it doesn't mean that you have a same result that you have in the large scale farm because um, mainly because you have a different airflow and different size of a room. So the scalability is a key that, to advance this technology. 
So this is a one of example of the resource use efficiency um, comparing the outside and also um, plant factory in the greenhouse. So this is a maximum theoretical value. So the plant factor, as you can see, the water use efficiency is quite high. This is one uh, because the plant evaporates, uh, release the water, and then since it's closed environment, you can reuse the um, water using the air conditioner for the drain water. So this is like a recycling the water. So one of the uh, main challenge now is that uh, we need to increase the efficiency for the lighting. So there's some advancement uh, thanks to the LEDs efficiency, but there's still much, so much um, room to be improved. So maybe we can address that on um, the panel discussion later. So there is so much, uh, it's, this is exciting moment in the sector since I've involved this sector since 2008, but this is like a most exciting era. And there's so much interesting projects going on in everywhere in the world and a different system. So I would like to introduce a little bit of the history of the Japan. Um, so there's um, the first generation started in the 1980s, the second the 1990s with the floated lamp. And after 2009, um, that's to, uh, the third generation, especially uh, installing LEDs. And I'd like to address that on the focus that after 2017, we can say that we have entered the fourth generation um, for the scalability, so lots of um, large scale farm selling also to the food service, for example, the, for the convenience store for the sandwich because it's clean and you don't need to wash. So it's in a consistent supply and also automation and AI, phenotyping using machine vision and the breeding, also the collaboration. So this is an interesting company called 808 Factories um, because this is, you can see that every time I visit, this is like this clean. It's hygiene management is it's, it's great in this farm. So they are literally sensing, collecting all kinds of data to check the resource use, even the waste every day. And they can prove how clean and how good and how consistent they produce are with the data. And this is one, um, another company called Spread. Uh, you can see the cultivation room, the uh, Amman cultivation room with automation system. And this is uh, one of the example of the cost ratio. So you can see the depreciation and the labor and the electricity is uh, three major costs. And electricity cost has driven uh, reduced uh, thanks to the LEDs and efficiency group. Um, they also the productivity, so uh, it's really important to measure the productivity on each uh, resource use. If, for example, cultivation area, labor hours, electricity, maybe we can address that later. Um, so the biggest challenge is that how to find the ultimate set point of environmental factors for maximizing multi-objective function. So I think the next generation, ideally, so the farmer, um, the maybe um, plant manager have an object, objective, and then uh, AI can help us to find the ultimate set point. But I think the key point technology is a phenotyping, meaning like you get, uh, you put the camera and you, you automatically collect what's going, what's the expression of plants. So the tricky part is that um, even it's a factory, but plants is, I mean, grow every day. So um, it's an interaction with the environment, you change the environment, the plants grows, but then the environment and change. So it's really, it's really complicated. So that's a tricky part. So I think we need to, uh, we need to keep going and developing the, uh, this system to track the, all the, uh, the growth rate of the individual plants. And then uh, this is very exciting for the ex expected increase of plant factory market is tremendous. Um, so there's even um, the biopharmaceutical sector is also promising. Uh, there's one company using strawberry for, um, for the veterinary use. For, and then for the speaking of the sustainable development goals, I think one of the biggest challenge that we need to address is that the poverty issue. But I personally believe that this technology can solve this problem because help of the I IoT technology that instead of collecting cans, 
um, all the kids or the women can maybe um, find the ultimate set point and the growing plants with a um, small system using a smartphone. So I, I think in the future we can have individually the small system like putting on the off the air conditioner. Um, I think we will have this system in the future. So to, to achieve that, I think um, the integrated value of plant factory, I, to explain that, I think is crucial for the creating the shared value for the inclusive and sustainable society. So that not only the engineering science, but also social designing or even the art, I think it's all important for that. So we, we work together. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Ari. That was an awesome presentation. And I love the, the charts talking about the resource efficiency, which we'll get into later on in the conversation. So I will turn it over to Lauren now. Um, and Lauren, I will share my screen. Great, thank you, Natalie. Let Perfect. You can see it. Okay, great. Perfect, thank you. Uh, well, thrilled to be part of this presentation uh, and the discussion this evening. And a big thanks to Natalie and Jesse for having me um, and for your efforts in pulling this event together. It's a great topic and uh, we're thrilled at Branch Venture Group to contribute to it. Um, so by way of introduction, hello everyone. My name is Lauren Abda. Uh, I co-founded Branch Venture Group nearly four years ago now, which was established in continuation of the work of my first company, which is called Branch Food. Um, at Branch Food, we work to provide resources for food entrepreneurs by way of workspace programming and mentorship, uh, and actually launched our workspace in collaboration with the CIC at their 50 Milk Street location. So thrilled to be part of this. Um, and Natalie, maybe we can go to the next slide. Great. Um, so at Branch Venture Group, uh, we are a um, Boston-based, first and foremost. Um, and really recognize the need over time for greater support for emerging food ventures in this region. Um, and in large part, recognize the need for early stage capital uh, for emerging businesses that were launching and growing and seeking to affect the food industry. Um, so at Branch Venture Group, we, were born, uh, we was born um, uh, and to date has been one of the most active investment networks in North America, exclusively focused on the food industry for investment. Um, at BBG, we look across three main categories, inclusive of consumer products, uh, food tech, as well as ag tech, and I can get into how we define those areas a little bit further in the next slide, but essentially we are an angel investment network um, that works to identify diligence and make investments in emerging startups um, and are very enthusiastic about what's happening in the controlled uh, in, uh, environment agriculture space um, uh, based on what we've seen to date. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so at BVG, we look primarily um, in terms of stage at pre-seed, seed, and we see some Series A opportunities. Uh, we're looking for products that um, uh, are entering the market, haven't necessarily entered yet, uh, especially on the technology front. A lot of that technology is still under development and hasn't been commercialized yet, but are really looking, um, like I said, very early stage at opportunities for investment. Uh, the sectors that we look at, um, consumer products inclusive of food, beverage, as well as alcohol, um, branded goods, but as well as um, B2B uh, con um, uh, consumer product businesses. Uh, we look at food tech, which for us is uh, inclusive of digital content and media, e-commerce marketplace platforms, hospitality technology, supply chain technology, and we look at agriculture technology, which is sensors, drones, robotics, equipment, um, and even some life sciences for food. In terms of our geographical focus, uh, we look across North America. So we're looking at um, uh, primarily US-based businesses, but we also do look at some Canadian um, uh, founded companies as well. Um, and also look at international companies that have established a US-based entity. So uh, if you're outside of the United States tuning into this conversation, uh, if you have a US-based entity, we will consider you for uh, potential investment. Um, in terms of our activity, you know, we seek to make three to four new investments per year, but um, also reserve some capital uh, within our membership um, to support existing portfolio companies that go on to raise additional rounds of funding over the course of the year as well. Uh, we have about 13 portfolio companies to date. We'll be announcing our 14th here very shortly. 
Um, in addition to you know, our network, we are not only interested in investing financially, but supporting businesses which, with knowledge and expertise as well. Um, the majority of branch venture group members uh, have industry backgrounds. They've been operators. They've started their own food companies. Um, and so they're just as interested in contributing um, uh, uh, qualitatively as, as well as quantitatively, I'll say, um, to some of the businesses that come through our portfolio. And then in terms of check sizes, you know, on the early, uh, well, on the uh, smaller side, we've seen check sizes as small as 10K. Uh, most commonly we see 25K, 50K check sizes, um, but upwards of $100,000 or $500,000 for some businesses that are seeking funding. And most of the companies that come to BVG are raising, I would say in total, anywhere between a half a million to $3 million. Um, and the amount that Branch Venture Group contributes to that is uh, really reflective of how much is available in the round, um, what the individual um, capacity of the investor is, um, and how much has been allocated to Branch Venture Group uh, of that round. So, um, so that's our strategy. And maybe we can go to the next slide. Uh, and this is just our quick portfolio um, snapshot. You can learn more about all of these companies uh, and link to their websites at branchventuregroup.com. I won't spend too much time on it, but um, very excited about the space and uh, check out some of our um, check out some of our companies if you get a chance. Next slide. Okay, cool. So getting into the meat of it. Um, so uh, in terms of a historical look, um, you know, I, I suppose I'm going a little bit before um, Airy and a little bit after Airy, uh, just in terms of the uh, kind of historical arc of um, controlled environment, agriculture development uh, and technology. So the concept of growing uh, plants year round in a controlled environment dates back actually as far as the Roman Empire uh, with historical figures like Tiberius Caesar, who was the second Roman emperor, um, supposedly having movable garden beds um, built that could grow cucumbers, um, both indoors and outdoors, uh, according to the temperature, but consistently um, expose those uh, um, crops in those beds to sunlight. So that was um, at the very early stages um, where we saw the inklings of um, controlled agriculture. Uh, following that, which was really the precursor to greenhouses, um, which were used throughout Europe and Asia as early as the 13th century uh, and worked very similar, similarly as they do today by trapping heat uh, from the sun and insulating plants from cooler temperatures. Uh, but it wasn't really, it wasn't really until the 1970s that greenhouses in the Netherlands um, were the first to use computer-assisted environmental control systems. Um, uh, but unfortunately, rising crop pr cr prices um, made the cost of temperature control somewhat prohibitive, and so those efforts um, kind of were were abandoned, and um, they, those types of companies were forced to see, um, cease operations. Um, it wasn't until the 1980s and 90s that the CEA advancements in technology really made their jump over to the United States. Um, uh, probably no surprise through NASA, uh, which used CEA to grow crops um, in a prototype research facility uh, based at the Kennedy Space Center, um, and really providing evidence that uh, crops grown in this way um, could also be very nutritious um, uh, for long-term space odyssey and, um, uh, you know, compete with, uh, with uh, crops that were grown in fields. Um, but really it wasn't until 1999 that Cornell University, um, uh, a leader in agriculture um, uh, and a land grant institution built an uh, advanced commercial scale CEA greenhouse facility um, at their location in Ithaca, New York, which grew over a thousand heads of lettuce per day. And really since then, um, and increasingly, you know, with, with uh, acceleration over the last 10 years, CEA has been adopted as a commercially viable solution to food production. Um, and we've seen many businesses launch in that time frame um, that seek to build farms mostly closer to the point of consumption, um, particularly for urban populations. So uh, next slide, please. So now CEA um, is, you know, has been um, uh, defined as the growing of crops while controlling certain aspects of the environment in order to reduce pests or disease, um, increase efficiencies, be more sustainable, increase yield or save costs. And also CEA can encompass a variety of uh, facility types, which Ari did touch on. But um, as we look across uh, kind of the landscape 
um, those facility types really being greenhouse, greenhouses, vertical farms or container farms um, and different growing styles, which are inclusive of aeroponic, aquaponic um, and hydroponic. So I can get into these really quickly uh, if we go to the next slide. So aeroponic this is an example of an aeroponic greenhouse. Uh, so uh, translucent space, so you could see some light coming through um, the windows there. Uh, it is climate controlled, but the, the difference is that the plant roots are sprayed with a solution and are actually open to the air. Um, next slide, please. So this is different from an aquaponic greenhouse, which also does have translucent um, windows. So it does let light in. It is climate controlled, um, but plants are submerged in water um, that has been uh, used to cultivate aquatic life. So typically there's fish in there and other types of aquatic life that are contributing to the nutrition of the water um, that the plants are growing in. Next slide. And then we have hydroponic greenhouses, which um, also lets light in controlled environment um, where plants are grown and water is um, uh, in water as opposed to soil. So there is a solution there um, and it is uh, reinforced um, with ingredients, not necessarily um, cultivated with aquatic animals, but is a solution that has um, nutrition in it. Next slide. And then indoor vertical farms, uh, which are a little bit different. You'll notice that um, this is a, a dark space, but there is, um, uh, so there's not light coming in, but there is um, uh, lighting and it's a fully enclosed opaque room um, with a vertical uh, hydroponic, aeroponic or aquatic ponic system um, using specifically artificial lights, which is the major differentiator of that space. Uh, next slide. And lastly, container farms, which um, is sort of a self-contained growing unit, typically very, much smaller than some of these other spaces um, that has uh, vertical farming systems, artificial light, um, but is uh, producing at a smaller quantity um, and typically uh, um, fewer types of crops. So next slide. So as we think about um, CEA and sort of the costs and benefits um, of this space from a, an investment perspective, um, so increased productivity per square foot, um, being able to grow 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, um, really maximizes plant density and has um, served to accelerate growing time um, as compared to typical land cultivation uh, for crops. Um, the ability to meet future demands uh, by 2050, as, as many of us know, uh, it's estimated that the world's population will be nearly 10 billion people, of which 68% uh, will live in urban areas. And CEA, you know, it, it can really bring food production closer to the demand and increase um, uh, with that increased yield as well, um, can be a major contributor to, uh, you know, food resiliency of cities, um, as well as just general uh, source of food. Um, reduced input requirements, you know, operating a controlled environment enables much more efficient use of inputs. Um, conventional farming, as we know, uh, requires excess water and chemical applications um, because a large portion of each um, will be lost to runoff. And with controlled environments, um, you know, there's reduced risk of pests, weeds, disease, um, uh, uh, tainted supply from different environmental factors, um, as well as chemical waste, which is um, uh, minimized. Uh, lower environmental footprint, which is sort of addressed in that previous point, but you know, operating an enclosed system reduces waste and pollution. Um, uh, the most efficient CEA systems could require um, upwards of 98% less water than conventional farming. Um, so both you know, financially and environmentally beneficial for the operation. Um, and indoor agriculture eliminates runoff as well. We know um, now so much about you know, the impact of, of that agriculture on the Mississippi River, what's ended up in the Gulf of Mexico um, and various waterways that have had major implications on aquatic life in those places. Um, reduce labor and land requirements. You know, CEA operations leverage um, a lot of automation and technology, robotics, software, um, to automate a lot of those, you know, very back-breaking farming tasks. Um, and so, you know, definitely a, a benefit um, there. And, you know, meanwhile, due to, I think, greater productivity per square foot of land, 
um, CEA requires less arable land to produce a similar amount of harvest um, and yield. Um, so really optimizing space, uh, which is a major um, consideration for um, use of space slightly outside of cities as well. Um, increased food security and autonomy. You know, I think the COVID-19 pan uh, COVID pandemic has um, really highlighted this, causing you know, massive supply chain disruption and really has shown the fragility of um, food trade and, and our global food kind of supply. Um, I think CEA can lead to greater food security for countries um, uh, as well. And, and you know, placing those farms actually in the country and not allowing them to, um, are not necessitating their need uh, for trade as much. And then lastly, you know, I think flexibility in production, um, CEA provides the opportunity to be flexible with crop selection um, uh, as growing indoors, you know, really eliminates dependence on uh, local climate conditions and um, uh, agronomic conditions as well. So, um, so those are some of the benefits that I think we see with CEA and, and how we've um, evaluated them in the past, those types of companies in the past. Um, in terms of the challenges, you know, probably no surprise, which we can get into later, high capital requirements for launch and production, um, designing a building, retrofitting facilities, building the buildings, um, you know, very expensive uh, uh, to construct, but then also adding in the technology in terms of IoT sensors, automation, lighting, irrigation, um, can really reduce the profitability of these enterprises and I think has presented a, a major hurdle for new startup development um, of these types of businesses. Uh, at this point, you know, limited crop varietals as well, um, uh, you know, high operational costs mean indoor farms tend to focus on, you know, high revenue gen generating crops, um, most commonly leafy greens, microgreens, herbs, flowers, um, tomatoes, they just have quicker growing cycles, um, they're more space efficient and, and um, are also highly perishable. Uh, difficulties with pollination. So vertical farming takes place in a controlled environment um, without the presence of insects. So the pollination process needs to be done manually, um, which is labor intensive and costly. I think we have yet to find an automated pollination system. So if any of you are working on that, very curious to meet you, uh, reach out to Branch Venture Group. Um, uh, real estate agreements, you know, there is um, really a lot of that to work through. CEA companies usually get space through renting, leasing, um, or owning real estate, which is, you know, subject to change the value of that according to market demand. Um, so a, a variable cost, um, which we see as a cost of um, uh, uh, potentially um, growing these businesses. And then just lastly, the ability to scale, um, you know, due to facility size constraints, it, constraints it's still costly um, for growers to scale operations and oftentimes um, uh, expanding into new crops or, um, or, you know, creating more crops based on your existing facility necessitates more building. And so um, a little bit more difficult than just acquiring land, you've really got to create this, this whole system. So um, uh, some of the costs and benefits that we see with CEA. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just really quickly, um, you know, market size for CEA grown crops, I wanted to show this quick graph. Um, currently, indoor farms have focused on leafy greens and tomatoes, as I mentioned before, um, but many are looking to expand to higher value crops as a point of differentiation um, and really provide a path to profitability. Um, specifically, Dristol's has invested in plenty agriculture, which some of you may have heard of, um, to begin growing strawberries, uh, the continued legalization, the continued legal legalization of cannabis um, in certain states has caused a remarkable increase in indoor farms um, focusing on that vertical. Um, and, you know, I think furthermore, the estimated market size for crops commonly grown in CEA facilities um, uh, are, are shown below. So you can kind of see how it's increasing um, over time. But I think with more innovation and the ability to produce different types of crops in these spaces, um, we will see facility, facilities gravitate towards more higher value crops. Next slide. Uh, so in terms of important factors for investment consideration, um, uh, you know, there's the standard kind of team, traction and market, business model, go to market strategy, um, competition differentiation. Um, you know, if you're launching a consumer brand associated with this um, company, the market analysis, all of the standard things that go into just kind of general investment consideration. But 
I think for CEA companies, um, areas where we've really focused in on our unit economics. Um, so currently entrepreneurs, you know, utilizing greenhouses have a much faster path to profitability than vertical farming. Um, container farming is also a viable option, but um, scalability and volume is, is really the limiting factor. So with new technology uh, like automation, um, efficient energy or you know, seed breeding enhancement as Aria touched on earlier, um, this can improve over time. And I think given the significant portion of total costs uh, being attributed to variable costs um, as vertical farms and greenhouses achieve greater scale on an individual farm basis, you know, they look to become more competitive with outdoor conventional farming. And I think we will, um, we will get there. It just takes time. Um, in terms of crop selection, you know, again, as CEA matures, more innovations come in, um, uh, new types of crops are able to be created. Um, uh, I think we will see, you know, just in um, uh, different really paths for sales opportunities, whether it be directly to consumer, but also into, um, you know, food service, into supplements, into vitamins, into um, cosmetics, uh, uh, those different sales channels for this raw ingredient um, will start to emerge and we're already seeing companies kind of go down those paths. Um, government assistance and USDA regulation, uh, you know, many companies look for grants and government assistance. Um, governments are highly interested in food autonomy particularly and, you know, and we've certainly seen that as I've mentioned through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, they're not yet able to market themselves as organic crops, however, because um, they're grown indoor and organic certification is very much based on um, uh, growing plants in soil. And so um, we can't get to, um, we can't get to that uh, certification yet, which is a major driver of consumer purchase. But um, again, I think it's only a matter of time. And as that definition evolves, um, uh, CEA crops will be able to be considered um, organic. And then, um, uh, as I mentioned before, just in terms of you know, the sales channels, um, food service particularly uh, versus retail, um, there's a lot of flex flexibility to distribute and sell through those channels, which tend to be uh, larger and don't require necessarily a lot of brand building in the consumer space. So um, uh, with that combined with the hospitality sector, catering services um, may provide greater profitability for some of these companies that are coming to market. Um, next slide. Awesome. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, kind of an overview of how we're thinking about CEA at Branch Venture Group and the types of companies that we're seeing. And I uh, hope that's helpful to help shape the conversation. Lauren, thank you so much. That was such a great presentation and nice overview of what's going on, the history and sort of almost similarities and differences too between Japan, particularly on the vertical farming piece of it. So I wanna dive right into questions. And one major question that we got both from the audience, but that's something that's been on my mind as well is, we know that the technology has been around for years, for decades, um, but it doesn't. It it it, it has felt like it it hasn't come to any sort of commercial viability until recently. So, what are the technological barriers as of late that have been overcome so that it is now commercially viable, and what other barriers need to be overcome in the future so that it can become a more profitable proposition? And would love to hear um, from Ari and Lauren on the sort of US and or Japan and US side, but really there seems to be probably very similar barriers in both regions. So would love to just hear from both of you on, on that topic. Great, um, thanks. Uh, I loved Lauren's presentation. Thanks a lot for sharing that, um, first of all. Well, um, I think there, to answer the question, Natalie, I think there's two aspects. The first is like, I mean, I think the concept itself is very uh, sustainable, um, this se sector. But I think the socially, I think demands have developed so that because we need more consistent because of climate change, you know, there are social, I mean, you know, there's so much difference, I mean, compared to like 50 years ago, I think so, even the food industries or even the energy company or investors all really realize that we need this technology so that actually even the, I mean, consumer, I mean, the commercial side, I mean, people want to buy the product more than before. I think that's a business side and also technological factor. I think this, the, 
research has been done for decades, but I think we need to utilize, because as I mentioned, like to find the ultimate set point, we need a help because this is like a so much complicated factor to find the best environment because there's so much freedom to find a, what's best for plants. So I think with the help of the development, development of AI or like a machine vision or even like a breeding or even like utilizing smartphone, I think the cost for utilizing those kind of technology has driven really, I mean, lowered so that we can now utilize that. It's the time and the perfect timing to utilize that. But I think all the technical factors are all important. But I think the point is that we need to integrate all the factors because you need to understand not only agriculture, but also engineering, your know, biotechnology or even design and everything. So we need to integrate all these kind of factors. So I think that's a key. But I think it's, it's, it's a matter of timing I think we can do if we collaborate with the different um, you know, sectors, I think. Yeah, and I would just add, um, I think you know, commercial viability in many cases uh, depends on the ability to sustain a business financially in the near future. And I think with CEA, there, you know, there are huge capital costs and requirements to develop these facilities and also to continue production at scale. And I think to Ari's point about the reduction of the cost of that technology um, is important. Um, uh, and also, you know, I think we're, we're looking at crops that aren't necessarily commanding a premium price in retail or other sales channels. So what we've seen is, you know, the large um, capital coming into these businesses on behalf of uh, governments or, or private funders, um, we're seeing the reduction in cost of technology. Uh, but then we're seeing the need for some of these businesses to build a brand and really invest in growing um, consumer awareness and recognition around uh, the produce that those companies are creating and really talking a lot about, you know, um, uh, about the brand and, and why buy this brand of produce and the environmental impact and the sustainability impact and um, trusting food that's grown in controlled environment spaces because it does reduce, you know, potential for um, contamination and, you know, being um, tainted for, you know, as part of the supply chain or just, you know, left to environmental factors. And so I think as we think about the commercial viability of them, um, uh, in large part, it, it will be related to, to brand development and consumer recognition um, and willingness to pay a premium for these products. I think I'd like to add a little one point that because since under COVID-19 situation and in Japan, especially in Japan, the like consumer realized that how clean it's because it's sealed, packed inside mm -hmm. the, like a food factory. So we can prove how clean it is. So people will actually need in this. So, I mean, the vegetables, so the, their company are selling more. There's more demand um, under this situation. Yeah, that's a really good point because I, I think the next question I had was targeted to, to Lauren, which is the amount of investment capital in the US into these companies has been enormous and it has skyrocketed, particularly since COVID-19. And so are there any lessons or insights that you have for Japanese companies that are interested in attracting this type of capital? Um, I know you obviously mentioned branding and there's obviously this appeal of super clean um, and traceability. So could you just talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so um, I think building on, you know, kind of what we're um, looking for, particularly related to CEA companies um, that I mentioned in the presentation, you know, standard things apply, right? So having a strong product differentiator, you know, having your IP protections, understanding your value proposition and the path to market, um, having a strong team around the table that can help achieve the success that you're kind of envisioning, knowing your com competitors here in the United States as well, um, how much money you need to, um, to accomplish the milestones that are really reflective of meaningful progress and success. Um, I think you know, many food related investors here, you know, are under, understand the market potential for these businesses, but for Japanese companies, you know, elaborating on, um, uh, you know, how you see that evolving is, you know, conducive, all, all conducive to serious investment consideration. Um, also, we've seen a lot that have developed strong strategic partners um, helpful in this area. 
um, maybe not, uh, well, I shouldn't say maybe not, but uh, particularly on the software side, if you're creating some sort of software to augment um, these facilities or service to um, augment these facilities, um, understanding that is uh, supportive of investment consideration. Um, for companies originating in Japan, I think, you know, two, explaining why you're expanding to the U.S. market uh, is uh, something that we as investors, I think, are very curious to understand. Um, why not other countries? Um, uh, as you think about, you know, of all the ones that you can go to, why, why the U.S.? Um, presumably some of your investors, you know, based in the country that you're, um, that you've originated in, uh, will continue to support you. But if they don't, you know, why are they not supporting your continued expansion and growth? And maybe a red flag, red flag, if they're not, it may not be a red flag, but, you know, just being really forthcoming, I think about, um, the full picture here is, is really helpful for us. And, um, lastly, you know, understanding the culture around investment here and, um, how that may differ from obtaining investment in other parts of the world is important. Um, uh, you know, for those of you on the call that are seeking um, US-based investor capital, um, going with warm introductions, trying to connect with folks through LinkedIn, um, following up, being persistent, being forthcoming, honest with information, um, uh, you know, treating investment as a collaboration and, and truly a partnership, I think is crucial. And um, establishing, you know, the types of relationships that you're looking to obtain and, um, uh, you know, ultimately agreeing on the outcomes of success um, uh, and having that conversation is, is really important and really helpful. So, so, you know, kind of how we think about um, uh, investment here. And, and I'd like to think for a lot of the companies that have been capitalized in the hundreds of millions of dollars um, at this point, uh, you know, a lot of them have built a strong investor network around them that could help them get to where they want to go. Um, and in many cases, those investors did have you know, food, food industry related expertise and backgrounds that were particularly helpful beyond just the capital too. Awesome, thank you. Hope that was helpful for some folks on the call. And going back to this appeal of these companies to begin with, which is the ability to use resources more efficiently. Um, Ari, you talked about how light, lighting and electricity was a huge cost. But then on the other hand, both you and Lauren spoke about the benefits of minimal water use, minimal environmental footprint, or you're not using much land, you're sort of repurposing existing buildings or building new buildings. Um, so are these vertical farming, controlled environment, agriculture technologies, are they actually sustainable? Um, and if what else needs to be done to make them more sustainable? So Ariel, I'll ask oh, you. To okay. Go to Lauren. Oh well, we'll share the slide again, probably the chat. If you can. Yep, we can see. Great. So I think the theoretically um, plant factory body golf farm is sustainable. But I mentioned, but there's so much space need to be improved. So it's not perfect yet. I think we are still in the infancy of this exciting I mean, era for the future. So especially light, light energy has to be improved compared to the maximum theoretical value, as you can see here. And I think we got some question about the, how much um, electricity we um, consume that um, roughly speaking, depends on which um, region that you are, cold area or some, um, the hot area, but um, roughly speaking, you consume there, um, to produce 100 grams or what, well, I mean, you don't use uh, metric tons, but um, uh, the uh, 0.1 kilogram fresh produce, you consume roughly speaking one kilowatt per hour. hour. And then roughly speaking, the ratio the, for the consumption depends on the company, but roughly speaking, 70% will be used for the LED lights and then 20% for the air conditioning because you need to keep cooling the air. Um, air. And also the rest of the automation. And if you are more highly automated, I think the rest of the equipment will go higher. Yeah. And I don't have too much more to add. I think I would just say- I think, uh, One of the follow-up questions that we have. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead, Natalie. I didn't have too much more to add. I think Ari got you the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
one of the other sort of follow-up and related questions that was in the chat was how do you control for contamination and spread of pathogens within these indoor facilities, whether it's a greenhouse or an indoor vertical? Well, I think it, it, that to answer the question, I think we need to define completely because it depends on which facility you are for the indoor plant factory or vertical farm, highly controlled, sealed, that it's more like a food factory that you need to go through the air, um, the air shower room and wearing the white, white gown and the hat and mask and, and hygiene and control. So um, it's, it's like a food factory. But I think it's less pathogen and more risk for the greenhouse because it's not controlled if you compare with uh, completely indoor condition. My Lauren, feel free to add <laughs> the comments. No, I think that that was great, um, Ari. And yeah, I think I would just reiterate, you know, CA is still in a nascent, um, we're still in a nascent time and, uh, uh, you know, while we do have long-term goals of you know being a major contributor to world you know world food demands, um, there's still a lot of kinks to work out in in getting there. But I do think, given the fact that um, you know CEA in many cases, um, if not originally now, is um, kind of has a lot of consideration around its impact on the environment. I, I suspect that will be you know a major value in um, continuing uh, its growth and change and development. Um, that people will have a very sharp eye on on that impact because we know how negatively impactful um, uh, alternative and, and more traditional forms of farming have been. So, a um, bit of a higher level answer, but um, but I think that I'm encouraged by that being a major kind of component of a lot of the reason these companies have been started. Yeah, kind of related to that, a lot of these environmental and resource constraints that we have obviously affect the entire world, but seem to more acutely affect, affect certain regions of the world that are actually not in the US and Japan. So thinking about islands and other countries, well, Japan is an island, um, but other sorts of countries that are not only suffering from climate change, but um, contaminated water and other basic resources that are needed for productive agriculture. And, and as you think, Technology, um, how do you foresee them expanding to other areas outside of the US and Japan? And how are to sort of a more resilient food system outside of the US and Japan? But also, is vertical farming and controlled environment agriculture, is it more nourishing than traditional agriculture? And can that address some of these other issues in countries where there's limited access to nourishing food? So quite broad, um, but I'm just gonna throw it out there for first. Well, I can definitely jump in on the nourishment um, uh, piece of that question, which I think is a good one and, and one that, uh, you know, we've certainly uh, tried to understand as the space has evolved. Um, I think like all crops, you know, the nutritional value of that produce originates with the soil that it's grown in. And you can have, you know, two heads of lettuce that have wildly different nutrient profiles depending on where they were grown and, and the environmental influences on, you know, it's, um, it's life. Um, so I think what's great about CEA is that, you know, you can control that nutrition and in many cases you can optimize that nutrition. So you can make sure that the plants that are growing, um, you know, have all of those necessary components. And you know, as we think about the fortification of food, like milk has been fortified with vitamin D in order for our body to uptake um, uh, calcium in it more efficiently. Um, you know, can we fortify some of the, some of this produce um, to optimize the nutrition that we're ultimately extracting from it? So, um, uh, you know, that, and, and I think beyond the actual produce, you know, there's virtually no chemical pesticides or fertilizers being added to this produce. So, you know, you're also reducing, um, uh, you know, potential in, intake of those things, um, which we do get from, from agriculture, conventional agriculture produce, whether it be conventional or organic, there's a laundry list of chemicals that are allowed on organic produce to be used on organic produce. 
um, but you're also reducing environmental contaminants as well, um, which you know end up in a lot of runoff and things like that. So, so I do think there's a strong case for the nutrition um, uh, aspect of these of this produce. But I'll let um, uh, Ari weigh in as well. <laughs> Yeah, I think the um, beauty, beauty of this sector is that we can control the environment to, to, to design the plants as we, so lots of, I mean, interesting research has been done using L, how we control LED lighting to enrich the vitamin C or, I mean, other uh, nutrition component. And I think that's a exciting part. And then in terms of the development in the other sector, I think before, even in the United States or Japan, that we have like a poverty issues of the, I mean, so I think lots of um, great um, contribution has been done for the so social programs. I mean, using this CA or vertical farming uh, technology, I think that's something we need to keep going. But also I think if we are addressing the global challenge and uh, issues that I think we need to al always think about um, how we contribute to society and especially like a poverty issue as I mentioned in my presentation. So I believe with the help of IoT and then distributed farming system, I think we can utilize this technology to help solve the, I mean, the, you know, food issues and even like for the poverty or, I mean, nutritious issues in the, to improve the people's, I mean, quality of life, I think in the sectors. But we need to, we need to have like, a, maybe Lauren can help help us, but like a microfinance or different investment, I mean, platform, I mean, for the different purpose, I think, not to earn money, but I, to help the society to, to, to provide the educational opportunity for the young generation in those kind of countries. I think we, there are so many things we can do, I think. Awesome. Yeah. And so my last question is, in addition to geographic expansion, is product expansion. So both of you mentioned that there's primarily focus on leafy greens. And Lauren, you showed also, you know, strawberries. Um, talk about cannabis, because that's not quite a food product that we want to discuss <laughs> right now. But just these other products where you can have a full suite of food grown in these mm -hmm. facilities. What does it take for this sort of product expansion to happen? When do you see it happening? And what products do you think um, will be next? Ari, feel free to take that if you'd like to start. Oh, right. I think commercial, if it's not commercial level, I think, I mean, the research based, I think almost all the crops has been done. I mean, to, we can grow any plants, even wheat or rice or uh, even for the medis, medical, medicinal use. And then, and then commercially, I think up beyond the leafy greens and the, uh, like vine crops, tomato and strawberry has commercialized. I, but I, I think it's a matter of timing and even like roots crops and even, even the leaf, leafy greens, lots of the company, of, especially in the United States, I believe it's the cut it, I mean, cut it, cut it leafy greens, but also the head or different, I mean, I mean, structures. And then, so I think it's more even like a nursery plants or even different, I mean, edible flowers and like lots of, I mean, even different, I mean, ways of using the plants, I think, even the same plants, I think is the key. Like you can flower in the small, short, short, I mean, short plants, you can have a flowers and then for, I think the interesting things, I mean, <laughs> we can keep talking that, keep talking that. For that. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think as um, uh, CEA becomes more sophisticated, you know, more innovation in terms of crops being grown will come in. Um, I think we're, it still remains to be seen how much of a premium consumers are willing to pay for this type of produce. And, you know, we certainly have incredibly well capitalized companies that um, are, are testing the waters right now. And I think if it is shown that this is, um, you know, that consumers will pay a premium for spinach grown in this type of environment or other types of greens or or higher value crops like strawberries and berries. Um, uh, I think that that will potentially dictate what ends up being produced in these types of facilities um, because ultimately those companies will be able to maximize their profitability um, by selecting things that people are willing to pay a 
more money for. So part of me thinks that it's going to be led by the consumer, but of course the technology needs to be there to be able to produce that and at scale as well. So that we were all of the audience questions. We are right at uh, nine o'clock. Um, so I just want to thank Ari and Lauren so much for their participation as speakers. We could have literally had an entire conference about this because this topic is so massive. So trying to fit it into an hour was, was pretty difficult, but I think we did a, a good job. And hopefully to all the audience members, this was a good overview. And obviously I would love to stay connected with anyone interested in the space. Um, and Venture Group, JPI doing great work. So definitely you know, follow up with them if you're interested. Um, so I will turn it over to the event, but thank you so much again, Ari and Lauren for, um, for your words and insights and, and just advice for Japanese companies as well as US companies. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Us. And yeah, just to echo Natalie, I feel like we could have been here all evening or morning, depending on what time zone you are in. Thank you everyone so much for attending today's event. And thank you again to our speakers, Ari and Lauren, um, and to Natalie for helping me put this whole event together and for moderating the excellent and interesting discussion. Um, I will send out an, a feedback survey later on, um, but I'm also going to share the link in the chat. So if you might just have a moment to fill that out, um, we would love to hear your thoughts on this event and also hear about any other topics that you want to hear more about um, in the future. CIT hosts dozens of events like this one every month that give innovators chances to connect and collaborate, whether it's within Massachusetts or across international borders as well. So I hope you'll check out our calendar for other upcoming programs. And thank you again, everyone, so much for coming. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.